Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras. And coming up in today's newscast, the IDF unveils a massive terror tunnel from Gaza as Palestinian terrorists launch rockets into southern Israel. Meanwhile, the coronavirus cabinet removes all but one city from the red list. And finally, ILTV takes a closer look at the faces of Israel's upcoming coronavirus vaccine trials. Rocket fire launched into southern Israel again late Tuesday night. Palestinian terrorists in Gaza firing the projectile towards Israeli territory, stripping red, tripping red alert sirens just before 9 p.m. Thankfully, the Iron Dome defense system intercepted the missile, preventing any injuries. And though no particular group has claimed responsibility for these uh, latest attempted strikes, by 11.30 p.m., Israeli fighter jets and attack helicopters were retaliating against underground infrastructure belonging to the Hamas terror organization, which governs over the Gaza Strip. Meanwhile, to Israel's north, the Sana news agency in Syria is alleging that a missile struck a school building overnight in a village in Kuneta's northern countryside. And though they don't provide any other details from the strike, the UK-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights is also reporting a missile attack in the region with several resulted casualties adding that Israel was likely responsible. But they also go on to say that the attack hit a pro-Iran militia base. Israel has conducted hundreds of airstrikes on Iranian and Iran-affiliated forces in Syria over the last decade, vowing not to let hostile forces encroach upon the border. Israel rarely admits to any direct actions in Syria, though. And true to form, when asked about the alleged strikes, Defense Minister Benny Gantz replies, quote, I won't go into who fired what last night. We won't allow terrorist operatives from Hezbollah or Iran to set up in the Golan Heights, and we will do whatever is necessary to drive them out of the area. Later adding, listen, things happen. In other news, the overnight rocket fire comes just hours after Israeli defense forces unveiled the latest discovery of an underground attack tunnel stretching from Gaza into Israel. <laughs> Lofty words from the Israeli Defense Minister as the IDF announces pinpointing and neutralizing a terror tunnel from the Gaza Strip that stretches dozens of meters into Israeli territory near Kibbutz Kitsufim. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu similarly saying that we will continue to take determined action in all sectors for the security of Israel and against any attempt to attack our sovereignty or our citizens. According to the IDF, the tunnel was found during ongoing efforts to destroy such pathways into Israel, now with the aid of a sensory concrete barrier around Gaza that's quickly nearing completion. Military forces then blocking off the area and closing the crossings with Gaza for undisclosed engineering operations. Particularly alarming about this case, however, is that this tunnel was reportedly recently dug and independent of the network used by Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad until the IDF destroyed them in 2014. IDF spokesperson Brigadier General Zilberman adding that in recent years, tunneling has taken center stage among terrorist organizations, with this tunnel in particular receiving a lot of cash investments that should have been directed to social welfare in the Gaza Strip. And as per policy, the IDF will be holding Hamas responsible, though no group has claimed responsibility. And joining me now with more on the conflict along the southern border is Middle East expert Dr. Mordechai Kedar. Dr. K Dr. Kedar, thank you so much for being with us today. Pleasure to be here, Aaron. All right, so my first question for you is, you know, no group, no, in, no single group in, in the Gaza Strip has claimed responsibility for building the terror tunnel. But which groups are capable of having built it? Well, there are uh, two candidates. One is Hamas, and the other one is uh, Islamic Jihad. There are uh, small groups, others like Salafis, but I don't think that they have the capability to dig such a thing, because this is a very, very expensive project, it takes a long time, and I'm not sure that Hamas would let them even do such a thing. Um, you know, they won't give them any permission. So it's, uh, for, in my humble view, either Hamas or the Islamic Jihad. So do you believe that, you know, then, then the, um, you know, the Hamas is probably the most likely candidate? Because, you know, Israel obviously retaliates against Hamas as, as a matter of policy because they're the governing entity in the Strip. But is that 
misplaced, or is that really the right way to focus? Look, both organizations have good motivation uh, why to dig such a thing, which actually uh, proves that they are planning a war against us. And the war will start with an invasion into Israel by this uh, tunnel of dozens of jihadists, maybe an assault on one of the kibbutzim or the, the Israeli places there, um, kidnapping, um, you know, civilians. And they know very well that Israel is very sensitive in, in this issue, and this is a very soft belly for the Israeli society. And uh, later, they, they will negotiate on uh, anything which they want. So uh, definitely, they have a, a vicious uh, a, 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 a intentions vis-a-vis -vis Israel, no doubt. And uh, you know, the fact that we here, we, that we have, let's say, some few months of silence does not mean that they became uh, peace activists, those people in Gaza. All right, well, so, you know, speaking of the war, because you said that they're planning for a war, but really these tunnels have been an ongoing issue for at least six years now, since the 2014 Israel-Gaza war. So, uh, you know, now the new smart barrier around Gaza that's nearing completion is really uh, how we found this particular tunnel. But, you know, are we doing enough? Look, uh, I have no idea because I'm not in the army. Hmm. And even if I knew, I would uh, expose it. Uh, look, uh, the, the Israeli army, the IDF and the Ministry of Defense, they know their ways. They, uh, they have their experts. And uh, they did what they did. And they try to do the best, which they can, uh, according to the technology which they own. And so, so do you believe that you know, uh, Defense Minister Benny Gantz is doing a good job, or do you have maybe any notes for him as a former man of, of security and intelligence? No, this project is an ongoing project for many years, uh, at least five years. In general, um, with his response to, to Gaza and Hamas, you know, because we've also seen rocket fire, we've also seen a uh, recent attack in Syria. So in, in do you believe that uh, Defense Minister Gantz is doing a, a good job in his position? Look, don't forget that Gantz was a chief of staff. Uh, and he, he knows uh, what to do with the army and how to behave and how to act in this security. I, I have no doubt that he, that he knows exactly. Don't forget that Netanyahu also uh, is uh, Mr. Security, as is being called here in Israel. So together, uh, I think that in the, in the security issue, they cooperate fully without any political issues. All right. Dr. Mordechai Kedar, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Moving on, Israel's coronavirus numbers are thankfully continuing to improve. But is the improvement being exaggerated? Nittany Manson reports. For the first time in weeks, Israel's serious COVID infection tally has fallen under 600. The health ministry reporting the contagion rate now falling down to below 3 percent, nearly half that from this time last week. With that in mind, the government overnight has decided to remove the red city label from all but one place, the Jerusalem town of Ramat Shlomo now the only one still in full lockdown. Israel's COVID cabinet then announcing plans to meet today on further easing lockdown measures. New active infection numbers now dropping to 21,010, serious cases at 591, and the death toll rising by 7 to 2,278. But not everyone is convinced. Many experts in the country already warning of a third wave, with a senior health ministry official reportedly telling Hebrew media that they're expecting a significant rise in infection in the next 7 to 10 days, adding that given the level of violations we're seeing, there's no escaping it. Several officials are even questioning the supposedly improving infection rate itself. Infectious disease expert Ian Miskin telling the Times of Israel that we can't possibly know how bad it is, particularly in the ultra-Orthodox communities where the disease is most widespread, because people simply aren't being tested enough. The Haredim, on the other hand, feel as though they're being incited against, especially following a suspected arson attack, masses taking to the streets in protest. The Gur Hasidic sect, however, was the most notable protest, with hundreds from the community crowding the streets of Arad, all wearing masks, meticulously standing two meters apart, and in full coordination with Israel police. Religious party leader and Knesset member Yaakov Litzman, who is himself from the Gur Hasidic sect, 
later also adding that he wants police to look on and see how the ultra-Orthodox keep the law, in contrast to the anti-government protests ongoing in Jerusalem. So what's the solution to all the concerns about figuring out just how bad the infection really is? Well, testing, of course. And now coronavirus czar Professor Roni Gamzu has announced that every Israeli citizen, regardless of symptoms or lack thereof, can now get a test. Until now, only Israelis in red zones or areas with high infection rates could be tested so freely. Everyone else had to first consult with a physician to get tested. And the physician was unlikely to approve the test unless you were traveling or unless the patient suspected themselves of being infected. But Gamzu is saying that, in his opinion, as many people as possible should get tested, with or without suspicion that they have the virus, adding that he wants the whole state to report an infection rate of under 5% and that there are enough kits and lab technicians to even return results within a few hours. In the meantime, as testing increases and infections drop, let's not forget that Israel also plans to begin phase one human trials on a vaccine candidate by the end of the month. The caveat being that rarely, if ever, has any vaccine gotten to human trials so quickly. So who are the brave souls signing up for this first study? The Israeli Institute for Biological Research, or IIBR, is announcing human trials for their proto-coronavirus vaccine beginning by the start of November, and recruitment for the trials reportedly began earlier in October. Well, altogether, 100 Israelis aged 18 to 55 are said to be participating in the trial, half to be used as a control, meaning they'll receive a placebo drug, while the other half gets the real deal. And director of the trial, Aaron Benami, says that it'll consist of one vaccine and then a year of follow-up checks, adding that the move from the first phase to the second phase could be just a matter of weeks. So would you be brave enough to sign up for the trial? Well, these three volunteers are. From left to right, meet 41-year-old father of two, Dr. Zev Yitzhakson Hayosh, 39-year-old Russian-Israeli immigrant and father of two, Fried Zapov, and 47-year-old engineer and father of three, Boaz Kolodnil. The volunteers telling Ynet News that they feel that they must do everything within their power to try and make a change and find something to fight against the virus. למגלה להתמודד עם זה לאורך זמן בוודאות, זה אך ורק על ידי השקעה במדע, בנתונים מימנים, במחקר ובמערכת הבריאות. כאילו זאת תהיה הדרך היחידה לדעתי לחיות עם, ה... עם הווירוס החדש הזה שעכשיו כנראה לא הולך, ל... לא הולך לעזוב אותנו בקרוב. יש לי תחושה טובה, יש לי תחושה ש... שהגוף שהכין את החיסון, הגוף שעורך את הניסוי, יודע מה הוא עושה, ואני מאוד מאמין בשיטה המערבית לפתרון מגפות מסוג זה. Now, in the meantime, for all the businesses in Israel still struggling to make ends meet amidst the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, social media platform Instagram may hold the solution. Here to discuss is Ynet News Editor Yulia Kara. Yulia, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> all right, so what's, what's new about Instagram? What, what, what are we talking about here? Well, basically, in honor of uh, Instagram's 10th uh, anniversary, they've decided to um, programming feature in Israel. It's been available in the U.S. for a while, and uh, soon it will, it's already available in Israel partially, and soon it will be um, uh, available fully, which means that um, shoppers, Israeli shoppers, will be able to check out, will be able to purchase and products and check out inside the app. Now, if you go to a certain product, it will take you to an external website where you would have to um, enter your credit card information and um, register. And uh, fairly soon, you would be able to check out within the app. Wow. So you're saying fairly soon. So you're saying that, you know, at, at least the in-app checkout is not yet available? Because, yeah, I mean, I've heard that, you know, maybe some, for some people it's not quite functioning properly. Yeah. The problem at the moment is that in the U.S., they're using Facebook Pay to check out within the app internally. And uh, the problem is that Facebook Pay is not available in, uh, in Israel as of yet. So mm -hmm. they're trying to see which method they're going to use to make it the most convenient for the, for the shoppers to, um, to shop. So they have announced it, so it's definitely happening. Um, and it's happening for Israeli businesses only, meaning Israeli shoppers would be able to buy 
from Israeli businesses. But uh, the, the feature where you're, uh, where you're able to check out within the app is not yet uh, functioning, not yet operational. Wow, all right, so what, what kind of stores are, are you know, standing to benefit most from, from this new uh, feature on Instagram? You know, is it just clothing? No, any store, whatever you're selling, uh, jewelry, furniture, whatever it is, you can sell literally anything. So especially now with coronavirus and stores being closed, that would be a great way to, um, to sell product, especially now that Instagram said that they will not charge 5% commission that they charge over in the U.S. until until before uh, they don't they didn't really say until when it's going to happen but for the foreseeable future they're not going to charge wow. israeli businesses five percent commission so that's incredible it's really helpful that's incredible so you know why why do you think that this is being un un unveiled in israel or rolled out in israel uh, and the united states or is it available elsewhere as well uh it's available in other countries as, as well um, it's been available in the U.S. for the longest time. It's been there for a few years. And they've decided to, uh, for, once again, for their 10th year anniversary, they've decided to launch different features in, in different countries. Um, I assume that the, the money speaks probably, so they, they thought it was a great opportunity to allow this feature to be operational in Israel now that we're in COVID and all the physical closers, uh, physical stores are closed. Of course. All right. Well, I hope that this uh, provides some relief to all the businesses that are struggling right now. Yulia, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Now, speaking of business, one of the biggest economic outcomes of the peace deal with the United Arab Emirates so far is now unveiled. An Israeli firm now signing agreements to pipe Emirati oil all the way to Europe. The Memorandum of Understanding signed between the state-owned Europe Asia Pipeline Company and the Med Red Land Bridge Company, a new joint venture between Israelis and Emiratis. This during the brief landmark visit on Tuesday by American and Emirati officials in Israel. And essentially, the parties have agreed to extend the existing pipeline between Eilat and the Israeli port city of Ashkelon all the way to the Arab Gulf. The agreement, coming at a value of between $700 to $800 million over the next several years, with plans to hopefully begin supplying by early 2021. Palestinian Authority, meanwhile, is of course again condemning the United Arab Emirates, though both for their signing of the Abraham Peace Accords and for their visit to Israel this week itself. But the comments are seemingly backfiring as senior PLO diplomat Saeed Berikat continues to receive treatment for coronavirus in Israel's Hadassah Hospital. Health officials saying that he's now been put on an ECMO life support machine while resting in critical but stable condition. In other international news, if you're an Israeli immigrant or emigrant, listen up, because this next story concerns you. A new bill being pushed in the Knesset now looking to ease the Israeli tax burden on foreign holdings. Joining us with the details is author of the bill and Knesset member with the Blue and White Party, Michal kotler wunsch Knesset member, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, the bill is extremely important, both for Olim um, um, immigrants that are living in Israel but working abroad, um, and beyond that, prospective um, new immigrants. And I'd say, in addition, returning Israelis, um, of which many, and we hear all the time about the um, uh, increased interest in the possibility of returning to Israel from all over the world or making Aliyah, immigrating to Israel from all over the world. Uh, the importance of the bill, I would say, alongside uh, the coronavirus challenge is to identify the opportunity of uh, creating or reducing the barriers uh, for preventing people from emigrating to Israel or those living here already and having to pay this double social security um, um, payment to countries with which Israel does not have yeah, a so treaty so regulating gonna, that. So that's exactly what I was going to ask. You know, what, what is the current code and what is your bill looking to do? So really, it's just to equalize uh, uh, those in the in the situation with which um, they are in, uh, 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 obligated to pay double the tax, both in their home countries, or rather Israel being their home country, but both in the country in which they work and in their home country being Israel. And with most countries, or with many countries, the state of Israel does have uh, by national agreements, treaties that regulate that overlap. Uh, with countries such as the United States, the state of Israel does not have such a treaty, nor will it have such a treaty. And therefore, uh, it really is a matter of equalizing um, uh, the, the, the payment due 
by those that happen to be working in the United States and living in Israel, as opposed to, let's say, working in Canada and living in Israel. So really And having to pay... Yeah. No, so realistically, Sorry. like, how many people are, are standing to benefit from this? So that's a really hard estimate, right? So we, we know that there are hundreds of such people currently in the state of Israel, and it's also a matter of how much they're paying. And there are extraordinary amounts of money, actually. So for each of those individuals, it really is a very heavy burden. We don't know how many of those um, um, that would be moving to Israel have uh, actually not done so because they're afraid to lose their livelihood or have to pay double the payments. And we don't know how many of the returning Israelis or Israelis living abroad currently this would enable to consider moving to Israel or returning to Israel um, if they were to be assured that they wouldn't be in this predicament, which is an unfair predicament, really. And it's just, as I said, equalizing the level of payments of all other um, uh, employees of all other companies of all over the world, other than um, the company, uh, sorry, the countries with which we do not have a treaty regulating this double payment. So now I, I understand that Yesh former Yeshatid Knesset member Dov Lipman actually tried to pass a similar bill but was not successful. Why does this bill stand a better chance, or does it? Uh, so hopefully it does. Um, it's, as I said, you know, being introduced and has to go through the legislative process. It's also a matter of the, you know, longevity of this Knesset, which uh, every day seems, you know, a little precarious. But I'd say the following. If we manage to push it through to the first reading and it's been exempt of, um, and it has been exempted actually of the 45 days in which it has, has to, you know, remain, uh, you know, basically tabled. Um, the fact that it's been exempt of that means that as soon as uh, the um, minister, the ministers actually gather, the legislative um, uh, committee of ministers gathers, uh, then it can actually be pushed forward to the first reading of the bill. And once it has reached that level of first reading, then it's very important to um, realize that uh, even if in such occasion that we don't look forward to, but if the Knesset does collapse, then it would be able to continue from that stage. So the second and third reading um, would be much, much simpler to push through in the next Knesset. Wow. All right, well, Knesset member Michal kotler wunsch good luck with this bill. I think a lot of people are, are crossing their fingers. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Finally, in other news, we just can't get enough history here at ILTV. Israel's civil administration now unveiling an amazing archaeological discovery made in a dig site close to the town of Beit El in Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank. The ancient site dating back to the Second Temple period. And it includes an ancient water hole in which the recent discovery itself was made. A cache of ancient ceramic jars was found. Experts explaining that apparently the hole was part of a residential Jewish neighborhood that lived in the area roughly 2,000 years ago. And then the jars and other artifacts that were found were also found stored neatly in large plastered niches carved into the sides of the watering hole, indicating that at some point the space was likely repurposed as storage. But at any rate, all discoveries will undergo restoration and will soon after be put on display for public viewing. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Last night, Jerusalem got some surprise showers, but tonight is overall looking to be a little bit more dry once again. Lows averaging across the country at 66 degrees Fahrenheit or 19 degrees Celsius. And then tomorrow, you can expect sunny skies and warm highs of 88 Fahrenheit or 31 degrees Celsius. And now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. That, that is meditation right there. That is, that is focus. To have all those kitties playing on you and not react. Oof. I would not be capable. All right, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.37 shekels to the American dollar and 2.58 shekels to the Canadian dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching.